Okay, hello everyone. Uh, thank you for coming to uh, the, the Tweak talk. Uh, the fewer Tweak files you see, uh, the better I like your theme. Uh, my name is Jorge Diaz. And I'll first uh, present myself. So, uh, as I said before, my name is Jorge Diaz. I've been working uh, with Tuple for something like nine years already. And uh, currently working as a themer and front end developer uh, for a company called Evolving Web. We're based in Montreal. And you're probably seeing our stand in the other side of the, of the wall. So, to kind of uh, break uh, the ice, uh, do you guys know what this is? It's a dial up modem, the, the one you connect to your phone and get online. Well, that's what I've been using. Uh, for seven of those nine years, because I originally come from a pretty nice place located in the Caribbean, known as uh, Havana, but eventually I fall in love with Drupal, I ended up uh, moving to Canada two years ago. So uh, when we moved to Canada, I started working at Robin Web, and, uh, uh, and we loved doing Drupal at Robin Web. Uh, it was founded like a long time ago, like 10 years ago, by Alex and Susan Dergachava, you probably made them from previous uh, camps. They've been around for a long time. And essentially, we help um, um, assist organizations to build uh, multiple kinds of Drupal solutions. I mean, when I mean multiple kinds, uh, I refer to uh, from uh, traditional portal or platforms to present information using Drupal to uh, document management systems like the one we built for the Canadian government or a certification platform for Internet of Things devices that we built two years ago for uh, all Sina Alliance and many other things. And more recently, we've been like mainly focused to moving uh, Drupal 6 and Drupal 7 websites into D8. Uh, this is something uh, that of course started after D8 was released almost two years ago. Uh, we kind of were pioneering on doing this uh, migration uh, process. So we, we work with a lot of big fish, like the Linux Nation, the Canadian government, a lot of universities, travel city, and so on. So I'll be talking about uh, today about Drupal theme. Uh, as I said before, I've been working with Drupal 6, 7, and 8 recently. Uh, done a lot of uh, things on top of those uh, platforms, I would say between 30 and 40 websites in total in all this time. And uh, for this presentation, I'll come up with a case study uh, of a website that we recently built and launched called Liscos Canada, that essentially it's just a cars website uh, that came up after the idea of uh, we were looking for a car and then uh, we, we didn't have any idea what options did we have uh, for a monthly budget. So we started doing Excel spreadsheets, a lot of things, and finally we came up with uh, like a slider where you can go and say, okay, let's say I want to pay uh, $400 per month for a car, what options do I really have available right now? So this started as a hobby and it ended up being a product. We built like a manufacturer page and then we built like a huge home page to attract uh, clients, present the information, and build a uh, business around it. So that's what I'm going to be using as a case study today. So I've just seen in the previous slides, uh, this is a Drupal site. Uh, it seems okay, maybe nice or not, but it's, let's say it's a, like an average, nice looking site. Uh, but that, that took uh, some time to ship. So, uh, we have to, to achieve this with either Drupal or whatever CMS, you need to build a theme. So, uh, going to the, the most basic definition, what's actually a theme? It's, it's in just more than a folder inside of your project where you're gonna have a template folder inside of it and then in there you're gonna have a lot of files that define uh, how your site's gonna look like for everyone. But uh, before jumping inside of that folder, I would like to go first to what's actually the theming process. So, uh, if we also see it like pretty basically, uh, 
theming it's more than going from basic triple side to a final end product that we can actually uh, launch or make live right away. So essentially this is a process uh, and this is what I'm going to be talking about today. Uh, what it's uh, for us that process and what principles we follow each time we need to take a product from position A or status A to status B. So I'll be talking about today the six uh, main theming principles that I believe should be applied in any triple theming process. And before jumping into that, uh, let's say I jump into an interview and I'm looking for a themer or someone to work uh, with me on a project, uh, which will be the ideal uh, prospect that will really uh, I'll be interested in working with. So if I will make a definition of a Drupal 8 themer, I will say if someone has uh, front-end developer skills like you know CSS, HTML, jQuery, uh, JavaScript, of course, uh, and some other front-end libraries like Bootstrap, Foundation, and so on to build up the solutions, but at the same time has a strong knowledge of Drupal site building. It isn't just like one side or the other one. It's like this midpoint between the two. And I would say that if a candidate fits into that, uh, or, or a client or someone I'm hiring to build a Drupal thing, that will be the most appropriate person to go with. So, principle number one. Theming it's using a base theme. Sorry. So as soon as we install Drupal 8 or 7 or any other Drupal version, we're gonna have running right in front of us a Drupal based theme. So a base theme is something that already uh, gathers together a lot of features like functionalities, libraries, and visuals that create a final end product. This might be pretty simple, but for the Drupal core developers, this is their end product. For us, might be our start products to come up with a new site right after that. So, plus that, each theme that comes with Drupal core, let's look at it this way, we have core, modules, node. Each module inside of Drupal has its own template file. So you can see here, inside of nodes, we have the template folder, and then each module uh, adds to Drupal the template files that he specifically needs for displaying the features or information it's going to add to uh, the Drupal project itself. So seeing it just uh, raw, roughly, uh, Drupal itself is a basic thing. It's the most basic of all themes we can use. So if you want to go further, and that of course for us is like the second level of uh, implementation, you can go for additional contributed themes. And this is what people use the most nowadays to build uh, Drupal sites. So on this specific case, uh, I will refer again to the case study. We went to use the bootstrap based theme that it's uh, also uh, maintained by multiple core developers that take care of making the best match possible between the popular front-end library and the Drupal core. So uh, a lot of times I come out the discussion, why don't we move the library into core? That's a separate thing. So whatever external or third-party library that wants to be added to core should be maintained in country. Because Drupal is one thing, and then whatever you want to add to it should be separate. And that's a philosophy pretty well follow with this uh, template. Uh, the fact is that it ended up that Bootstrap is the most popular theme used by the Drupal community. It has that many amount of uh, installs and you can see how many it has so far for V8. And of course, what, why using a base theme of that level? Because uh, this third-party uh, front-end framework provides us a lot of tools and functionality that doesn't come with Drupal by default, or not that easily. Like uh, this kind of drop-down navigation, uh, like building advanced grids uh, and content uh, containers inside of the site. Uh, the actual responsive behavior of all these elements 
and like models and many other things that we might need to use in our project. So, going back to the file I showed before, uh, we were inside of no templates and then we have the list of template files. As I said, core come with, comes with its own template files, but at the same time, we have running core, then we have the template file, the, sorry, the bootstrap base theme running on top of it, and then we have our thing. So that file I was referring before, the node uh, specific template file, it's uh, using the all three levels of this stack. So core has its own template files, bootstrap theme has its own template file that matches uh, the best possible with the framework and then our theme is going to have uh, its own template files. So this hierarchy is uh, hierarchy all the way bottom up. Which means that if course has a file with the same name also in the base theme and then we have another one, our final site will be blindfolded for whatever is from this level down. So, if you're using Bootstrap theme just nat natively, we will be ignoring core files, but that's okay because the Bootstrap theme is maintained by a community or by a sub-community inside of the Drupal community and they take care of that this works well. But then if you're creating our own theme, we need to be sure that we're doing things right because we will be blindfolding our site for everything that's right below it. So, if we come up with updates, whatever we update core, if there was an update on that file, our site won't use it. And the same with the base theme. So, as I said before, core is maintained by community. The bootstrap theme is maintained in the issue queue for one side, and on the other side, it's maintained by the bootstrap community, which is totally separate. And these guys of the issue queue take care of uh, providing us, the top level users, the best integration possible. And then right on top of it, we are. So, we have to do it right. First thing, we always need to sub theme. That's the first thing. You always need to have a third layer on this stack. If you're going to use a base theme, you need to ensure to be always separate from the actual base theme. That way you will support future updates and be, uh, I won't get hurt if you actually update your own code. Uh, of course, second, stay where you need. If you really find something that it's broken in the actual sub theme, then go to the issue queue and notify, hey, there is something broken here, do you mind taking a look at it? The community is pretty active, all the people help, and it's better to do it that way. It's like the right way to, to address that issue. Uh, don't move things around. I mean, you can go into core, take the node file, and put it right on top. And that's going to work, but that doesn't mean that's going to work right. You might be uh, breaking even the bootstrap behavior or relationships between your files. Uh, number four, of course, update as regularly as possible. Uh, stay up to date with core and the community theme too. And the same goes for modules. And number five, uh, as I mentioned before, if you find an issue and you can identify by yourself that it's core related or it's bootstrap theme related, go to the issue queue and report it. Uh, so you can go to our blog. To our blog. Uh, I have a blog post from uh, almost a year ago about planning uh, how to choose a Drupal based theme and another one doing an analysis of why Drupal bootstrap baking is so uh, successful. So, uh, principle number two, theming is site building. As I said before, site builders uh, working on theming, it's really, really important because they will save a lot of time. Doing site building, it's using themes, it's using modules, it's uh, incorporating libraries, it's creating content types instead of going to tweak files and creating fields and things. A lot of people do it, that needs to be like, it's, it's hard to maintain and like the proper way to do it is always to follow the Drupal 8 uh, structure way of managing things. So 
One of the main things when doing site building is checking what's available out there for modules. When you use a module, you will then need to know uh, what library will require, what else, or what additional setups you will need to do. But modules will save you a lot of time when doing things. Like, I've seen people trying to reproduce during months, like a shopping cart, things like, like that, instead of using like commerce or using Uber car. So just to mention an example, when uh, in Drupal 7 there's a really popular module called WebForm that it's used for uh, capturing visitor submissions on many things like uh, actual polls or contact form submissions. And when Drupal 8 got released two years ago, uh, WebForm wasn't available. In fact, WebForm is available since six months ago. So this doesn't mean that you cannot use Drupal 8 if you want to get a message for one year and a half. So you have to look for options. And instead of jumping into building your own custom module, you need to actually research what's people doing. So using combinations like the contact core module, contact storage, and contact block, people were able to reproduce most of the functionalities of WebForm and achieve the same objective. Because the key is to actually reproduce functionality. So like building a form with Drupal 8 is not that hard. It's just setting up a few things. How many modules there are out there? Well, Drupal 8 only, if you filter, more than 3,400 so far. We have an blog post talking about uh, some Drupal modules you can do without, my colleague Susan, and <coughs> sorry, uh, and some other one that I, that, that I wrote. Okay, number three, and this is where I'm going to spend most, most of the time of the presentation. Theming is building views. Okay, so probably most of you, if you worked with Drupal before, are aware of what a view is but just in case to set grounds, what is a view? So if you go to Google right now and you Google for something like Drupal 8 themes, you're gonna get a set of results. So if you look closely, you're gonna see that there's first set of results that have this app block in the beginning, that it's page results. And then you're gonna have the rest of organic or natural result, results uh, on the page. If you jump to YouTube, you're gonna see that there's also a list of videos. If you go to Twitter, you're gonna see a list of friends on the left, a list of tweets in the middle, and then who to follow right on the right side. Sorry for the Spanish setup. If you go to Facebook, this is a little bit more advanced. You're gonna see like a notification list on the right, and then the active shot on the right too, uh, the wall, and many few other lists on your site. And even if you go to Google Maps and you do a search, you're gonna get the paid one, the organic ones, or the ones that are inside this context. But then, this is also a list, but it's a geographically uh, set of items. It's not just used using divs or containers or whatever we can call it. It's just a set of dots geographically located where they're supposed to on the map. So a view is just a set of data that's being represented in many different ways. And I'll just show you the most, uh, the top four popular sites of the internet. So everything today is a view. And Drupal was conceived to create views. So everyone can uh, work on it. So this is a sample page of the car site. This is like the page starts here and continues over here. I have to split it into to make it more like in Twitter. And then uh, this car page has multiple views. For example, this is a view showing uh, the prices. This is a view showing the prices with a discount. This is a view showing uh, related models of Honda Civic. Another one, another one. This is a view of feature car. This is a view of blog post. So everything in the site is actually a view. If you go to different pages, you're gonna see the page of a view with all the blog posts. And then the page with a single item view that's showing the feature model of the brand. And then more views, more views, everything inside of the site is a view. So now I'm gonna show you a couple of samples from the live site. Okay.
Okay, so let me just refresh multiple displays. Okay, let's go to a car page. I'm logged in, that's why it takes so much time. Okay. Okay, so take a look at these views over here. I'm going to maximize. So I'm seeing, right now, I'm seeing a Subaru car that it's all wheels drive, that it's from, uh, that it's an SUV. So, based on this context, I'm also displaying uh, four additional blocks, those four, that display additional uh, or, con or related information to the car I'm seeing right now. For example, here I'm showing all base offers from the same top level model, like uh, the 2017 uh, Crosstech, the 2018, uh, this is the manual, this is the automatic, and here it's saying this model, so this is the one you're seeing. If there are more, this view right over here, it's displaying all these results, but with JavaScript, it's just being resumed to the first three items on all views. So if you want to dig more on each one of the contextual uh, views, you can just expand it and see more. I'm going to hide it. So this one is the same, but it's all SUV vehicles by Subaru. So I'm seeing, uh, the, for, from the context, I get the, the type of vehicle, SUV, and the brand. And that's another contextual view. Then. We have these more automatic all-wheels drive SUV vehicles. This view, for sure, it's way longer. But you expand it if you really need to do it. Later we will talk about performance. And then the this month feature deals, this is the same for every car page. You just expand it and all feature deals are going to be listed right over here. So now I'm going to go and I will edit this view. I'll maximize to make this more. Okay, so you may notice, uh, as I show here in the slides, you can create multiple displays for the same view. So, these four views, these four views right over here, they use the same CSS, the same HTML, the same exact structure. The only difference is where they are placed and actually the title that's on the top. But all the rest of the elements, the show more and every other single item, is being reused all across those views. So based on that, using views, you can have like a common set of fields to display. And then you can have multiple displays to reuse this view everywhere. And then after building those four, we say, okay, how about if we go now to the sorry brand page and I go to Subaru right over here and I want to display the cheapest cars on the right we don't need to code again we have a view that uh, it's 90% set up for that we only need to change which parameter we want to use so right here on the manufacturer page we added this cheapest offer to Subaru Canada it's the same list, but it's displaying all cars that match that brand. And then we have the exact same view. Instead of displaying three cars, it's displaying four to make it match with the height of what I'm showing on the left side and make the visual more balanced. And then you have an additional information that people can browse to. You don't need to have a page uh, for cheapest offer for each one of the manufacturers. You can contextualize all of that on different places and build multiple things. So the same way you can do this, uh, uh, we add a lot of things like uh, this is another view. This is a geographically uh, located view using clusters. So with clusters you can, for example, right over here in Thunder Bay, you click on it and then you're going to see the dealer that's right over there. But if you click on the Ottawa area, Google Maps API integration with views, again, it's going to expand. There's no coding over here. To ship this, there's no coding. You just need to add the API key. You have to set up the module. You have to set up a few things. You have to test. You have to use uh, CSS style 
for setting up the ground to be black, the river to be blue, the rose to be another color. But the actual coating, it's zero. You don't need to do it. You just need to set up uh, the available components to it. So I'm gonna drag, I'm gonna go to Ottawa. Then I'm seeing Subaru, yeah. I'm gonna see, I don't know, I'll be Subaru. You click on it. And then you're gonna go to the dealer page, which is just, it's just a node, like the car is. And then as each one of these nodes has a geographic uh, position, you can use views again to create these kind of contextual blocks. Like closest dealerships to this one. Each one of the nodes knows where it's geographically located. And you can say, I want to display the proximity from the main node, which is all it is about this one scene. Uh, I want a view that shows the four items, four items, any items, but sort by distance from this one. And then you get the closest uh, dealer sort. So using views, you can do a lot of things. Like this exact functionality over here, you can create an additional uh, complementary view that will give an idea. If you see this dealer, how far away is the closest dealer of the same brand? This may seem like uh, you're giving too much information, but you don't know. Sometimes people might need it, sometimes they don't. And it's not expensive at all. So setting up that takes probably more time doing the CSS than actually making it work. And then you can build, again, I don't know if you've seen these blocks before. Well, here they are all of them again. Each one of the models of the car with all the available options on the dealer page. So it's a huge mesh of information that Views allows you to merge and present in many multiple ways, either geographically, uh, by different sorting uh, purposes and so on. It, it's, it's, it's definitely amazing the, the things you can do with that. So as I said before, I'm a front-end developer. I'm not a back-end developer. And most of this has been uh, CSS and view setup. Okay, so I'm gonna go back to the presentation. Okay, tweaks in view, sorry, sorry, I missed that part. Uh, let's go to a complex. Okay, have you seen each one of these? It's a row. That is a result of a, of a query. So uh, Drupal, it's asking the database which all the models of Subaru Crosstech and list them here. So this result might be simple. Nice and simple. It's an image, <coughs> uh, title, the model with the transmission, uh, the payments, and the, the term. But I'm gonna go for one that is a little bit more complex like this one at the bottom, that it's on every page. I'll just zoom it out a little bit. So take a look at this one. This is the feature deals of uh, this month. You're seeing now uh, four items. So each one, four items are featured on this section of the website. But each one of those rows or results, it's explained uh, like a label of this month, photo, price, uh, additional description with the car and a few other things like contextual pop-ups and so on. So this is not so something you can easily drag from the database. It takes some HTML customization and it takes some templating. So you have multiple ways to do it. Uh, this might be a little bit arbitrary and uh, for some people it might be a little bit uncomfortable to do it or not. Like uh, it's not uh, the ideal way to do it. but. Many people like me do. So uh, I'm gonna edit the view. Okay. And then, as you can see right on the left side, I will maximize to make it more readable. Uh, these are the list of all the fields I'm using. But as you may notice, I'm gonna search in my browser for hidden. Most of the fields are hidden. So I'm displaying something on that view, of course, because it displays something. But each field I'm getting from the database is hidden because I'm going to use it uh, eventually at the end. So this is the thing. I added, I, on my query, I'm adding the term, the price, the make, 
the year, the model, multiple things. But then I want to handle and manage that uh, on my own way. I don't want to do it uh, using the default views way. So here I have this global custom text field. And if I click on it, you will get where everything comes from. See, this is custom views field. Custom view fields allows you to use tokens from a few other fields that you have and build your own custom HTML. And then output all these fields in your own custom way. So this is like really variable. You can do it either here or in the template file. But I personally prefer to do it here because if somehow I need a new field, I just go in the view, I add a new field, I hide it, and then I have the available token right over here. Like the make, the model, the term, uh, the IDs that, that I might need for something not visual. I mean, you can do a lot of things if you are inside of this context. Just imagine you have like a strong database query tool that is view itself, and then you have this not so nice HTML editor. That's why I mean that's probably uh, the most uh, uncomfortable side of this approach is that you don't have maybe the coloring or the tab or, or the actual uh, wireframe uh, management. But the good thing is that AAA allows you to export configuration. So you can export this config and you have uh, your git track of every change to do on this uh, layout. So that's uh, definitely something that's amazing. <coughs> so going back to the slides, I don't change anything. I don't want to screw the live site. Okay. All right. So this approach, this, it's pretty flexible, it allows you to do a lot of things, and it has two main benefits. The first one, we already saw it, is how much you can reuse the things you do. So you can reuse things like, I don't know, uh, we were not expecting to have a recent blog post blog, but we had a view, and we said, okay, let's do a slice of the new one, put a blog in the home page, or every page, and that worked, and increase the compression rate, and people were going into blog posts from different places. And the effort was minimal. It was just setting up a block for a system view that showed three items instead of all of them. And you've seen this case already. Okay, so here's the question now. Okay, you've seen a lot of things that can be set up easily and it's a lot of database queries. And here's the question. It's this, how, how fast is this? How, is this feasible to, to, to take this approach? So let's take a uh, let's do a false analysis on, on this. So this is the card page. The card information is just the photo and this text over here. The rest is external notes and additional notes, and you can see this is related information, the offers, it's a separate note, all that is split. So we have the card page and the manufacturer page. So what does it mean? That this query over this set of blocks and views over here, they need to pull from the database some information before displaying. So if I have a car, and this car is being displayed as a feature car or a manufacturer, as the first one of the cheapest, as the first one of this full list of cars, and also as the car as itself in those related blocks over there, that's a lot of SQL queries running in your MySQL or whatever server you use, every time a user goes into your page. That's heavy, heavy, heavy. But, okay, even in the homepage, if I feature the car, that's a query too, also in the homepage. So it's a, it's a lot. But what happened? Triple Eight has something called uh, tag base cache. And it's amazing. How does it work? Uh, I'll share the slides at the end so you can go and see the URL. How does it work? If I have this card displaying all those views, the first time a visitor goes to this page, 
all those database queries are going to run for the first time, but the results are going to be stored in a cache table. This means that the second time that a person goes into the page, that person won't run all the queries. That person will be getting the HTML that was sent to the first person. So this makes everything crazy fast. I repeat, the first time you go into the page, you generate the cache for everyone else. Because the second person that goes into the site is going to get the generated page. It's not going to get all the queries again. Except that I go into my site and I update the year from 2017 to 18. Then the no, when I hit save, is going to go, you are invalidated, you are invalidated. It's going to invalidate all views. And then when a new person goes into the site, he's going to update the page again for himself and for everyone else. So that's known as cache warming. So the cache to exist, someone is to create it. I'm going to talk about later on how to uh, warm your cache and keep your site fast. But let's jump down again to the screen. Have you heard about this tool? Web page test. It was created by Google engineers to test website performance. They have like a cloud set of servers that emulate browser loading to compare uh, page speed. For example, if I run it in youtube.com, you're gonna get four seconds of page load. That's the time YouTube takes, or the fastest time that YouTube uh, can take to load. And it makes 67 HTTP requests to uh, YouTube servers. If you go to Facebook, just the, the, the login page takes two and a half seconds. If you go to google.com, you're gonna get 2.0 seconds, two seconds, and 12 requests. It's, it's pretty small. Okay, you can go to all these URLs, as I said before, I'll share the site, and verify all those results. I'm, I'm not making up any number. And, and here are also the results of the one I'm gonna show uh, now. So, okay, Drupal 8, come in, please. Uh, okay, this is a uh, simple Drupal 8 site, a fresh one, just installed, without the caching enabled. You run the test on it, and you get 3.6 second load, and. 105 requests okay now if you go and you say okay I want to enable caching and I want to enable aggregation that it's all CSS files into a single one all JavaScript files into a single one and then I run again you get 1.2 second loads on a simple Drupal site like even that site takes SQL queries how many blocks go into the homepage what menu items go here what menu items go in the contact uh, menu. So each one takes also, it's a small number, but it's SQL2. But when it's cached, it takes this time. But see the amount of requests, it's highly reduced to seven from 105. So a lot of CSS files and JavaScript files simplified. So this cost, uh, I'm putting the page horizontally to like get it a little bit better, because it's a little bit long. Okay, so each one of these vertical columns is a block. And let's say that this one is a SQL query that involves multiple entities, like cars with prices, match it together. We have the latest block columns. Uh, this is also a view that I'll talk about later. And these, two, these three are just blocks. And then we have the menu structure, that it's a drop-down menu. So uh, there's an SQL query that, get, that fetches all items and the logo, and the footer menu. There are multiple things that, that, that require an actual uh, database access. So without aggregation, it took 4.7 seconds to actually uh, load. And when, with aggregation enabled, it took 1.8 seconds to load the page. It just seems like a little bit saucery, but Drupal, it's then fast if you use it the right way. So uh, I'm gonna show uh, different example. Okay, this is the car page. It's a little bit more complex. Has the same footer as any other page on the website, including the home page. But then has this a little bit complex uh, view with multiple prices. And then has four heavy load views that you saw you can expand again like 50 or 60 uh, results in a column. Just a single one then, and you get four. So for this page, with caching and 
sorry, without caching, it took 2.6 seconds, and with caching enabled, it took 1.82. It, it's pretty fast. And it took more requests, because uh, there's a lot of files and many other things, uh, more car images, and so on. So this is the, the, the cache forming uh, app I mentioned in the beginning. It's, uh, it's free, it's developed by a colleague of us. It's called Cache Ready. Uh, essentially, you go into it, you set up your sitemap.xml file into it, and then it will go running to all your pages, and will be creating the first access to your site, and whoever comes after your visitors will uh, receive cache pages pretty fast, either Google or whoever uh, gets them all. So, of course, a Drupal is fast if you put it where it's fast. So, uh, uh, this cause it's uh, using uh, the Drupal caching system, it's running on Pantheon that is really optimized for hosting Drupal sites, and it's using Cloudflare for caching files to all these services. Uh, Drupal is free, Cloudflare, it's using the free platform, and Pantheon is like $25 per month, and you can see how, how fast it can be. And I'm not talking about any HTML simple site. I'm talking about a Drupal site that's using HTTPS, Font Awesome, uh, Bootstrap, web fonts, uh, high resolution images. So it's a heavy loaded website. Doesn't make any sense to, to, to spend time uh, trying to simplify it. Drupal by itself can be, can be fast. So Drupal is going to be slow, of course, if you don't do it right. So, it can actually uh, fly. So remember, you have to set up, you have to use the caching system. But for using the caching system, you need to use something that's ready for the caching system, like views. If you do your own custom HTML and do queries by your own, you're getting out of that, and then you're compromising the performance of your site. So if you use views, then you can use cache. If you use cache, then you're gonna get a really fast site. If you're fast and you're SEO optimized, then you're gonna be highly ranking, highly ranked, and then you're closer to succeed as a, as a website online. So that was uh, the longest as I said before. So theming is improving your information architecture. There are things that you don't expect to be uh, actually uh, entities on your site, but somehow you, you you can do it, and then you can optimize your site. There was a presentation before this one uh, about paragraphs that was really good. And this is the blue stripe I mentioned at the beginning. So this is like an informational text you can put in any page of your site. Uh, traditionally, you will say, okay, with Bootstrap, I can create three divs, and each one is going to have a call MD4 to have three columns, and then you can have this, and this, and this, and each one's going to be arranged, but then somehow, if in the future that needs to be changed, then you need to ensure that the client can either contact you to fix it or they know HTML to fix this. So the, the one of the nice approaches you can do is using views. You can have, uh, as I mentioned, paragraph to create these kind of entities that you you don't want it to be a page. You need to have a page saying. Uh, 15,000 NADNs, blah, blah, blah. You don't need to have that. You just need to have something to store your information. And then you set up a view to display three items showing those blocks in your homepage. So initially, you didn't conceive, or your client didn't conceive, I wanted to have a content type to manage three pieces of information on the homepage. And you, as a themer, as a, as a developer, can provide that kind of flexible solution to them. Because that can be multilingual, can be editable anytime, and the actual uh, website management experience gets uh, definitely boost. So, use views. This is uh, like a, the image they have in uh, the paragraphs uh, module page. With paragraphs, you can create multiple things. I just showed text, but you can create images, you can resort things, rearrange them. It's really useful. You can go to drupal.org slash project slash paragraphs to, to learn about it. And then, uh, <coughs> theming uh, is doing CSS. There's not really much to, to talk about it. Theming is doing whatever I talked before, plus doing CSS to achieving the visuals that you really want to do. 
So if you want to make uh, like your side beauty, I mean, if you want to use the default look, that's good. But if you want to improve a little bit, arrange things, uh, even to reuse the CSS and so on, then that's you, you have to use CSS today. There's no way to escape from it. And finally, theme is doing tweet when the five previous principles didn't achieve what you needed to do. Like for example, uh, you need to add a region, you need to do a really custom uh, function, then you use Twig. I'm, I'm not saying don't use Twig. Twig, it's the biggest power you can give to, uh, to a front-end project in Drupal. But see how, how many things you can achieve without using Twig up to this point. So you're not authorized to go inside this folder and do uh, whatever you want. So the Drupal community has pretty good guidelines of how to work with Twiggy templates. Uh, they're they're uh, really uh, good. And as I mentioned before, you might need like a creative region, you need to customize uh, things inside of things and out in place, or even to adapt to, to Bootstrap. There may be modules that doesn't fit uh, nicely with Bootstrap and you might need to do it in your own uh, thing. Then that's the proper way. So those are the six principles. As I said before, always remember, if you start using views, your project has a really high chance to uh, succeed either with search engines, uh, in future maintenance, and many other things because you're going through the right uh, path. So uh, my phrase is, if you use cash, you know what happens. And in case you want to uh, learn Drupal, we're doing a lot of training uh, in the next couple of weeks here in Ottawa, all of this is in Ottawa. Uh, we have a theming training next week, uh, online, site building, Monday, module development, in two weeks, and another theming training, uh, that, sorry, these three are going to be actually in Ottawa, these three are going to be online, but you can be in Ottawa and do it too, and that's it. This is the URL for the slides, and thanks for your time. Questions, I'll be happy to answer. Yep? Can you go down one slide? Oh, sure. <laughs> it's all right. Any other question? Okay, well, thanks a lot for your time, and hope you have a good day.